Yeah, so thank you, Krishnaji, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to participate in the seminar today from a distance. Um, I hope I'll see many of you in person in Nepal in the near future. But um, yeah, so as Krishna said, today my talk is on really shifting contours of landlord-tenant relations in the larger Mithila region. Uh, this is really an amalgamation of multiple different studies, which I've, I've kind of particularly some big surveys which we did over the last 10 years or so. And I'm trying to kind of bring this together to try and get a picture of the overall character of agricultural change, particularly in the Gangetic Plains. Um, no. So to just to introduce, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so landlord-tenant relations, what do we mean by that? I mean, essentially this is a dominant form of agriculture for those of you who are familiar, who are not familiar, sorry, uh, in many parts of South Asia where you have, you know, basically farmers who don't own the land, tenant farmers essentially working for landowners, generally paying rent uh, through a sharecropping, this idea of relationship where they give half of the harvest or more or less to the landowner. Um, on an annual basis, but also there's this uh, fixed rate take a tenancy um, or monk up tenancy whereby they they give uh, you know a fixed amount every year to the landlord. Now this is a prevailing feature of, of agriculture, not only in Nepal but in many uh, countries in the world, particularly the low and middle income countries, uh, in areas where there's a legacy of kind of very inequitable land ownership regimes. Um, now, the reason that it's significant, it's now I think this is a highly significant feature of the agricultural economy of South Asia, but uh, the extent of tenancy is often significantly underestimated. So in many government surveys will say things like, you know, maybe the area of land under tenancy is around 10% or 15%. Uh, that's because often they only care the official level of tenancy where people are registered tenants. But in reality, the vast majority of tenants are actually unregistered. So these are people who are working for landlords through purely through verbal or oral contracts. So there's often a significant underestimate in terms of the extent of tenancy, but also the burden of rent is also underestimated. You know, the, the, the impact, for example, for agricultural production, for food security, for agricultural investment, for farmers who are giving away 50% at least of their harvest to landowners, this is a, it's a significant burden on agricultural production, which is often not acknowledged by the development sector, by NGOs, by government planners, by many people working in the agricultural sector. But these are, um, what's interesting is that, well, this is, people don't really talk so much about landlord-tenant relations today as a significant problem. It was a huge debate, particularly in Indian academia in the 1970s and 80s, some very criticized debates, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, particularly over the so-called presence of semi-feudalism in agriculture. So what we really want to do today is to kind of revisit some of these debates and try and apply them to agriculture in the Mithila region, this is on both sides of the Nepal and India border, particularly in a sort of post-economic liberalization, so post-1990s context, particularly in the context of significant changes such as expanding markets and rising labor migration. And through this, I identify three kind of quite unique trajectories of change that we've identified from doing work across this region over the last decade or so. So as I said at the beginning, the study is an amalgamation of multiple sources. This is really following 15 years of field work. Um, so I did actually PhD research in the Morang region back in 2007. And since then, I did a follow-up study in 2019 with the same households. But in between, a large part of the research and stuff I did in between, sorry, I'm having some. So the research I did, sorry, I'm having problems with my computer, it's doing strange things. Okay, that's it now. So there's work I did in between. Um, so this included, for example, some large surveys. When I, as Christian said, I was based with the International Water Management Institute in Kathmandu. For around six, seven years, I've still got an affiliation with them. Um, while I was with them, we did a number of large farm surveys between 2012 and 2015 across uh, Danusha, Sapkari, you know, parts of Central, Thailand, Nepal, and Madhubani uh, and Purnia, Bihar. Um, as well as Simsari and Morang again in the east. 
Um, so I kind of I, I pulled together. We also did a large number of focus groups and interviews. This is part of several different studies. This included research on, particularly a large study we did on climate change and agriculture, and a second study we did on migration and agriculture. So as part of these studies, we you know we, we pulled together a lot of data. And it's only recently I tried to kind of look at all this data together, pull it all together, and see what are the kind of the divergent trajectories of change. And this is a kind of very broad sort of field area. The red boxes are the kind of sites where we collected sample data and again focused on, you know, the sort of, well, within the kind of Madashi belt or sort of problem two in Nepal, uh, sort of central Mithila belt. And in Nepal Terai, we did a lot of, we collected data from Donakar and Sapdari, uh, kind of east of the Koshi, not really Mithila, but on the sort of fringes of Mithila, but in an area where you've got predominantly Tharu or Adivasi communities. Um, we selected data in Morang and Sasana districts. Uh, one bit of data we collected in Purnia to the south, which has got many similarities actually with Morang and Sinsari, and also um, within the Mithilanchal, the core Mithilanchal part of Bihar, we collected data in two localities in Madhubani district. Um, so, you know, I should acknowledge that, that uh, I pulled the study together, but, you know, this, we, we had a number of people, particularly staff at the International Water Management Institute in India and Nepal, and in Saki, our partner in Bihar, um, they were also involved in the data collection for the study, and we, we've written a number of joint publications, which I can share uh, after the seminar. Um, so, you know, I should acknowledge the support which has gone into the multiple people who contributed data towards what I'm presenting today. Um, so the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, landlordism itself in the 21st century and what we mean and how we understand landlordism today. So um, I did start in point is to go back to the so-called mode of production debates. Now, many of you who studied agrarian, who, are, who know agrarian studies, or particularly those who have studied in India, will be probably familiar with the mode of production debate, particularly the older generation of academics, because this kind of raged through Indian academia in the 1970s and 1980s, and also extended to, you know, academia in some Western universities as well, particularly research on South Asia, but also Latin America as well, figured as part of this debate. Now, um, as most of you will be aware, countries such as India, for example, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, emerged from the colonial period with quite severe land inequalities. This is the legacy of the colonial Zamindari system and Viltuari system, which really, you know, propped up a kind of landlord class. And this system itself was adopted from the kind of Mughal period. So this, there was a uh, lot of- Sorry, uh, Fraser, sorry. Yeah. Uh, your, sound, your sound is not clear. Uh, could you make the clear sound? I can try and come closer to the microphone. Should I switch off my video, would that help? Uh, lots of people are making such comment as well. Mm, um... Yeah, now, yeah, now it's good. Maybe a little slow. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. So, I mean, I should I switch off my video, Krishna? I can't switch it off. That helps. Okay. Um. So, so as I said, you know, India emerged. India. Bangladesh, Pakistan emerged from the colonial period with quite severe land inequalities. And there was really fierce debate uh, over whether India within this period was part of a, a system we might call feudal, um, or whether, so this is talking about a static system, or whether India was making a transition towards what we might call capitalism. Um, uh, this was actually linked to political divisions within the Indian communist movement itself, particularly between the more kind of radical Maoist movement and the kind of the mainstream CPIN movement, uh, the mainstream parliamentary communist movement. We'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Um, but the first part of the debate suggested that Indian agriculture was moving towards capitalism. Uh, so this is a system whereby you thought, you know, you've still got big inequality in land, but you know, you're beginning to see progressive change in agriculture. So you're seeing, you know, high levels of capital investment, you're seeing, you know, high levels of wage labor. So rather than people working as tenant farmers, they're working as wage workers. Um, 
high levels of investment on the land. And while this is an exploitative system, it's also considered as progressive because um, there's, you know, technological change, but also there's opportunity for class solidarity. You know, laborers, agricultural laborers can get together, they can mobilize collectively for social change and to make a transition towards socialism. And the kind of the argument here, and the reason why this was a popular amongst the mainstream communist parties and the kind of within the parliamentary system is that they believe that a capitalist agrarian system opens up opportunity for a transition towards socialism within the current political system. You know, you've already got the class solidarity is already in place. You know, the technological change is already in place. So, you know, India can make the transition towards a socialist system. Then the second side of the debate suggested that actually India was not capitalist, India was feudal in character. Uh, feudalism implies a closed and stagnant agrarian system, one grounded in sort of quite parasitic landlord-tenant relations, high levels of exploitation, uh, particularly through what they called interlinked contracts. So this is when, you know, landlords- uh, Sorry, Fraser, uh, your yeah. sound is still not more clear. Uh, could you uh, stay away from your microphone a little bit? Yeah, is that better now? Yeah, it's it's good now. Good, great. Okay. So, um, so okay. So as I said, first was suggested India was moving towards capitalism. Second suggested India was moving towards what we call feudalism or remain feudal. So this is, you know, a closed and static agricultural system, uh, very parasitic kind of landlord-tenant relations, high levels of exploitation, particularly through rent, but also through the usury. Usury essentially means money lending, another word for money lending, uh, you know, high interest loans, um, exploitative labor relations. And often these contracts are all joined together. So the, the farmer, the tenant farmers, you know, they're taking loans of the same landlords who are who they're renting land from. They're also working for these landlords. So this allows a kind of super exploitation to take place. They also argued that landlords have, you know, powerful ideological control over the tenants, powerful political control over the tenants. And an important argument was that this is perpetuated by imperialism. So, you know, when you've got a distorted industrial sector, um, uh, they don't want the, you know, the, they're in an alliance with the landlords to kind of, you know, keep the people dependent. Uh, so they talk about, you know, the so-called comprador landlord alliance. Um, now, one of the arguments was that uh, overthrowing the feudal system requires, you know, it cannot occur through the parliamentary democracy and it requires a kind of revolutionary transformation. You need a completely new state. So this is why this, uh, this the semi-feudalism argument was popular in the 70s amongst the kind of the Maoist movement in Nepal as well as in India. You know, this idea that, that, that just keeping the current system in place isn't going to work. You know, the feudalism requires a complete revolutionary change. So those were the arguments uh, at that particular time in history. Um, now, in terms of models of feudalism, the, the classic model by, was by uh, an Indian economist called Amit Baduri, and he created this model of typical feudal landlordism. The argument was that you know, land poor peasants are bonded to landlords through the interlinkage of land ownership, labor, and money lending. So what this means essentially is that you know the tenant farmers take loans from the landlords, they repay these loans um, through labor, through working for the landlord, and in the process, the landlord is able to take a really, really high interest from the tenant because they have no choice. You know, they have to work for the landlord, so the landlord can add interest onto the wages, and they can charge the tenants extremely high rates of interest. And the tenants have no choice. The tenant farmer has no choice but to accept these exploitative conditions. Importantly, um, the argument was that the semi-feudal system doesn't follow the logic of you know, what we call capitalist profit maximization. So the landlords, they don't want to invest in technology. They don't want to invest in any technology on the land because if they increase agricultural production, this will reduce the levels of the tenant's debt. And as a result, their landlord authority will also be undermined. 
so so you know what he's basically saying is that, that the landlord depends on the tenant being in debt to the landlord so um essentially you've got no class solidarity no progressive technological change through this kind of system now it's clear after four now these debates took place in the 60s 70s and 80s now that was four or five decades ago it's clear that you know agricultural economy has changed significantly today and after four decades one there, there are two things which are clear well the first thing is that actually neither scenario is true today after four decades south asian agriculture on the whole has definitely not made the transition towards capitalism with perhaps some exceptions such as you know parts of the punjab where you've got quite you know industrialized agriculture however Baduri's sort of very static model of feudal landlordism also seems very, very far-fetched, particularly after economic liberalization. So, you know, landlords have many other opportunities to get rich. They don't just depend on what money they can get off the tenants. You know, many have jobs in the professional sector, in the government, and so on. Um, there's increasing opportunities due to economic liberalization. So there's a lot more market, there's more labor opportunities. Also, migration is highly significant. You know, these tenant farmers, uh, you know, the idea is that, you know, the landlord cannot continue to exploit the tenant because tenant farmers do have alternative opportunities for labor. They don't need to work for the landlord to repay loans. They can go and work in the city, they can go and work overseas in the Gulf, and using those money, they can repay those loans. And um, an article, there was a series of journals, a volume in the Journal of Agrarian Change in 2013, which basically said that the idea of semi-feudal landlordism is a relic of the past. It's not relevant today. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and apply and look at some of these ideas in the context of landlordism in the Matila region today. And the premise of this paper is that while well, landlordism has changed, it hasn't disappeared. So you, so you still have landlord-tenant relations. They're still exploitative. They're not as exploitative as perhaps they were in the 60s and 70s, but there are still great significant challenges. Now, although the total monopoly of power among single landlords has dissipated, there's limited evidence that kind of the distribution of landlords, the forms of exploitation have changed substantially. There's still severe landlessness across the Gangetic Plain. There is still share cropping. There is still money lending at extortionate rates of interest. These things haven't changed. What perhaps has changed is, is that these are not um, tied together in the same way in which they were in the 70s and 80s. And another important argument is that although there's much more capitalism around, you know, there's a growth in industry, the whole construction sector, service sector in countries such as Nepal, uh, there's a much more capitalist activity going on, but that doesn't mean that feudal relations cannot still exist side by side. And another kind of argument I'm going to make is that these changes also are uneven and they're divergent across the Gangetic lowlands. Now let's talk a bit about landlordism in the larger Mithila region. So, um, the early mode of production, the early economic system um, was what we call kind of was essentially where the state had ownership of land. Now you had, you know, the Mughal era in India and many different kingdoms or tributary states, such as the Darbanga kings and so on, uh, which were very powerful in the Mithila region. And in Nepal, of course, you know, you had the Sen kingdom, uh, which later gave way to the Gokali kingdom in the kind of 18th century. Um, now, under the kind of um, under the system, essentially, the state was the primary owner of land. It was the government, essentially, who owned the land. And when after the Gorkhali conquest in Nepal and also the British conquest in India, uh, what essentially happened is that the earlier tax collectors, the tax who used to collect tax from the from the government uh, for the government they essentially were propped up to, to continue to collect tax from the peasants. And the primary form of exploitation essentially was taxation. You know, so people were not so much paying rent to landlords, they were paying rent to the government. So under the Gorkhas, you know, a share of the harvest would have to go to the Malpot office, and then it would get channeled to the center to fund the Gorkhali sort of military campaigns across the Himalayan belt. 
Um, but there were sort of divisions within the peasantry within this period. So they were essentially divided into three categories. There was, um, um, sorry, two categories, I should say. There was those who paid tax directly to the, to, the, to the government. So many of the kind of free peasant farmers would be paying taxation, giving a share of their harvest directly to the government. But there were also what we call subtenants. So these were farmers who were paying rent to the landlords uh, to local landlords, and then these local landlords were given rent to the state. And these local landlords were themselves often the tax collectors. So they were the ones who were responsible for collecting tax, were generally the more powerful landowners who had land already and had some authority locally and were able to use that influence to rent out their land, their surplus land, to poorer farmers. So essentially, any surplus agricultural product, part was taken away by the government, by the state and part was taken away by the landlords. Now, Mahesh Regli called this uh, state landlordism. Um, this was similar to what Karl Marx called the Asiatic mode of production. And the Indian economist Aris Sharma um, said it was actually neither of these, but it was a form of what he called centralized feudalism. So, you know, essentially these are just different definitions. And I'm not going to get too bogged down, too tied down over what definition we use. Uh, just to give an example, you know, this is the Malpot office, the local tax collection office in a village in southern Morang. It was here, you know, the local farmers uh, would essentially, you know, collect, would take their share of the grain, deposit it in the Malpot office, and then that would go to the centralised run estate. Um, now, there was a bit of a shift towards the early 20th century in both India and in Nepal in terms of the distribution of surplus. The most powerful local families in the rural areas, as I said before, were those who'd been given the job of collecting the tax for the state. So these were essentially the zamindars under the colonial um, system uh, in India. The, in, in Bihar, these were linked to the Darbanga kingdom, for example. And um, in Nepal, it was the Jumidari system under the Rana regime, basically. And these um, tax collectors received land grants basically for their services. So they, and also they were able to accumulate land from tax defaulting peasants. So some of the peasants who couldn't pay tax uh, or couldn't afford to pay tax, they had their land confiscated. So essentially these people became subtenants. They essentially became tenants working for the tax collectors. But what happened in the early 20th century was as the Rana regime and the British colonial regime got new sources of revenue, particularly through international trade and import and exports, land tax became much less significant in the form of income. They no longer needed the you know, tax from the peasantry. So land tax became devalued in the early 20th century over several decades. And as a result, taxation you know, uh, became a very, very small share of the ethical surplus. So what this meant is that the landlord class was able to increase the rent and corner a much greater share of the surplus. So this is this was essentially the origin of the kind of typical landlord-tenant relations which you see today. So you have the former tax collecting class became the landlords and they were increasingly renting out their land to a growing class of landless tenant farmers and a significant share of the surplus essentially was being appropriated by rent. And the amount of surplus which was going as taxation was declining and becoming much less significant. And this is the origin also of the kind of semi-feudalism of interest during the so-called mode of production debate. So from the 1960s to the 1980s, well, of course, you know, the colonial period ended in the late 40s in India. The Rana regime collapsed in Nepal in the 50s. Um, but in spite of these changes, there was not any significant change in the agricultural system. So land reforms, for example, were largely ineffective. The only place where land reforms were possibly effective in the Gangetic Plain was in West Bengal, within the Mithila region, in Nepal, in Bihar. These land reforms remained cosmetic. They didn't really redistribute land because of the elite capture. Uh, land inequality in Nepal continued to increase the debt and also monetization. So as more money entered communities, debt increased, you had more farmers who were selling their land because they couldn't repay loans. And this was the time you began to see the sort of classical semi-feudalism, which people like Baduri had uh, spoken about, that model where you've got 
the interlinkage between land modernism and money lending, a strong overlay, overlap between caste authority and landlord authority. So this just to give kind of one case study, this is two villages where we worked in Nepal, Ikrahi and Tadi in Danisha. Now, some of the elder respondents, for example, from the tenant class who we spoke to back in 2014, they, they kind of spoke, we collected some kind of oral histories and they said that, you know, in this 1960s and 1970s, um, there was just a small family of upper caste landlords who held, you know, very, very large private holdings of up to 60 bigas of land. Um, they had this judge money system in place whereby there was, you know, ritualized exchange between the different castes, whereby tenants and laborers would work for free for landlords, and then they would receive grains as payment during festivals, or you know, different castes who had different occupations would do this work for the landlords and they would get paid in grain. But the elders also responded that you know poverty was really extreme during this period. Um, you know, many households didn't even have you know utensils or you know cooking equipment, they were entirely dependent on landlords. If they wanted to go to Janipur, for example, for some official work or to go, you know, to a government office, they even had to, to borrow the clothes of the landlord. Um, so you were talking about a very exploitative and very kind of enclosed system. Similarly, in Bhagwatipur in Madhubani district, so the site, another village where we worked, um, the elders here also recalled about, uh, you know, poor, you know, several decades ago in the 70s, you know, the poor farmers essentially were in permanent debt to the zamindars. Um, they would often take loans of grain from the zamindars, and then they would repay the zamindar at the harvest time at 1.5 times the borrowed amount. So they have a significant rate of interest on these loans. And then they would also need to do unpaid labor as well to the landlord as a way of repaying the loan. And, you know, we asked the question, well, you know, uh, given these exploitative conditions, this was very much the kind of the classical model like what Baduri spoke about. So we asked the farm, the elders, you know, was there no other opportunities? Couldn't you, you know, go to the city and work, you know, migrate, for example? But what they said was that, um, you know, um, not only firstly, they, to repay these loans, they had to work for the landlords. So they couldn't just say, we'll go and work somewhere else. They had to work for the landlord as a condition of these loans. They also didn't have spare cash. They, so they didn't even have money, for example, to pay for the train fare, even if migration was an option. And with low levels of education, there was also limited awareness of what opportunities there were outside. And you know, very few people sort of dared to sort of challenge the landlord authority or consider migration as an opportunity to escape subjugation. This period saw you know, some technological change, you know, Zamindars constructed public works, such as ponds, for example. Um, there were some sort of early interventions by the government, particularly in canal irrigation. But on the whole, agricultural productivity was very, very low. So what happened after the 1990s? So there was significant changes after economic liberalization, particularly in the Mithilantal region. Firstly, there was an agrarian crisis which was sweeping this region. So climatic stress, climate change is beginning to be felt, you know, by the 1990s onwards. This is pushing up the cost of production. Irrigation is becoming essential even during the monsoon period. Also, ecological stress is increasingly converging with economic pressures associated with liberalization. So there was an unprecedented expansion of markets into the Mithila region in both Nepal uh, and in BR, you know, through improved road networks, you know, expanding economic liberalization and so on. Um, and the building dependence. So you saw the decline, for example, of the judge money system. The judge money system kind of fell apart because many of these sort of traditional cottage industries were no longer necessary because people could buy factory made goods, you know, things coming from China, from India, and so on. You know, plastic utensils were cheaper than clay pots, for example. Uh, these sort of changes were taking place in the local economy, so this sort of judge money system became undermined. Uh, rising consumerism, you know, the cost of things like dowry increased significantly. These are the gifts laid out for a dowry wedding. You can see that, um, you know, the cost of living is increasing and the cost of marriages are increasing. You know, kind of gift exchanges which are required during weddings are increasing. So essentially people need more cash than they did before. The cost of agricultural input is also rising. You know, agricultural production is becoming more expensive. 
And with this, we see the rise in the migration economy. Former people migrating to Indian urban centers to work from Bihar, and in Nepal, migrating to the Gulf states in particular. So migration essentially has increased exponentially. Um, so in East Central Tarai, for example, between 1980 and 2001, there's 4.7 times the increase in the number of migration migrants. The feminization of agriculture stations says women are increasingly in charge of the agricultural sector. Uh, doubling of migration in Astani and Madhubani and Purnia and Gopalganj and Bihar, for example. My own panel data which I collected in morning suggested that the households just between 2007 and 2019, the percentage of households of migrants rose from um, just 10% to 25%. So, you know, it's more than doubling in just, uh, just uh, 15, 14, 15 years. So what about land inequality? Well, land inequality remains severe in this region. Um, so just this is a survey, 16 village study compiled across Bihar and Nepal. Across these 16 villages, you can see that, you know, a significant, um, you know, over 20% of uh, farmers are just landless laborers, then 15% of tenant farmers, another 15% are part tenant farmers, you know, own part of the land, rent part of the land, a large number of very small landowners, less than 0.5 hectares of land. But also you're seeing, you know, still a concentration of land as well. So, you know, those with more than two hectares of land, you know, they're less than 5% of the farming population, yet they own, you know, well over a third of the land. What does this actually mean for landlord-tenant relations? Well, what I'm going to show is that in terms of landlord-tenant relations, there's essentially three trajectories of change which we observe across this region. The first trajectory is where you essentially see the perpetuation of landlordism. So there are many communities which we studied which show much more, so I spoke about these two typical landlord-tenant relations in the 70s and 80s, very exploitative system. Now, there were some communities which show quite a, a bit of a persistence of this more typical landlord-tenant relations in the 1970s, which, you know, were prevalent in the 70s. And this is particularly common in Madhubani district of Bihar. So in Madhubani of Bihar, we saw, probably saw less change than what we saw on the Nepal Madesh district. But there are some parts of the Madesh where there have been changes, particularly in the Koshi floodplains, you know, just east of the Koshi River in Saptari, where you still see very kind of severe landlord-tenant relations. This is essentially a system where you've got a small, locally resident landlord class, generally descendant of the, of the former tax collection functionaries. Uh, generally, we find them, most of the class were from the Rajput or Brahmin community. Then you've got a large class of tenant farmers, particularly from the Dalit community, although in Bihar, we, there was also a lot of tenants from the OBC community, essentially Yadavs and so on, again, kind of middle castes. Um, there were still very powerful ideological relations of control. So, you know, the Brahmin landlords, for example, in one of the villages we worked in Madhubani, still had very significant economic influence over the tenants and political influence over the tenants. Very, very large estates, you know, often more than 10 hectares of land in general. Yet, of the, but, you know, these estates increase significantly. Some villages, 40 hectares, 50 hectares, were common within one family. Uh, and often these estates made up quite a significant share of the land in the community. So in one of the communities in Bihar, for example, just 2% of the, of the rural population owned, of the village population owned 42% of the land. The prevailing form of surplus appropriation is essentially batea or sharecropping. Uh, so 50% of the harvest is going to the landlord. Uh, so this is Malwahi, a uh, village in Madhubani where I've been working since 2014-2015. Uh, in this village, 62% of the land in the sample was rented from local landlords, most of whom were from the local Brahmin community. Um, and, you know, this was, uh, you know, very, very powerful kind of ideological relations between the, the landlords and the tenants. However, it's important to mention that this Although you still have these local level landlord tenant relations, this was by no means uh, the kind of archetypical semi feudal relations which were described by scholars such as Baduri in the 70s and 80s. 
there were there was significant change. Um, so, for example, you know, tenants were becoming a little bit more assertive compared to in the past, particularly in Bihar amongst the kind of OBC communities. So the Yadav tenants, for example, were increasing significantly in terms of their economic and political power compared to a generation ago. There was also very limited evidence of so-called interlinked contracts. Now, if you remember what I spoke about earlier, the classic studies of semi-feudalism suggested, you know, the hallmark of semi-feudalism was interlinked contracts where, you know, farmers are taking loans from their landlords and then they're repaying these landlords in labor or in rent. And they've got absolutely no bargaining power at all, a very closed and exploitative system. Now, this was not happening. It was very, very rare today. You know, things like bonded labor, for example, we, we didn't see much of this at all. Um, money lending was still very, very significant as a form of surplus appropriation. So farmers were still in huge debt, often being very high interest, 50%, 60% in interest. However, they were not taking loans necessarily from the same landlords who were renting out their land. So farmers said, you know, if they want to take a loan, they had five, six landlords who they could choose from. Or, you know, there may have been some private money lenders in the bazaar, or there may have been some rich farmers who they could also take loans from. So they were no longer dependent on just one single overlord to take loans. Labor migration also means that, you know, they had other opportunities. They were not entirely dependent on laboring for the landlord to repay loans, for example. You know, so they had alternative sources of income as well. There was, you know, some evidence of what we call corvy labor. This is where farmers are paying a labor rent. So this is quite rare. And what we mean by this is, as well as repaying the landlord in the share of the crop, they also have to work for the landlord for free. And then this is a very typical feature of a feudal economy, what we call corvy labor. Now we did see this in one village. This was quite laddy in Sabtai. We had a very powerful Rajput landowning class and mostly Dhanuk and Dalit tenants. Um, and then what, what was reported was that you know some farmers you know they would pay rent to the landlord but they also had to do other things like work in the landlord's house for a few days a month doing housework or cleaning or other jobs for the landlord for free. So this was still sort of prevalent at the time of research but this is probably rare and I think it's probably in decline. Now the second trajectory of change is where you're seeing a total decline in the landlord class. Now this I, I noticed this seems to be particularly common in the Madesh, particularly in province two, the sort of central Tara districts, the Maithili and Bhojpuri speaking districts. Um, um, what we saw um, was uh, a lot of the kind of the traditional sort of Madeshi landlord class, unlike their counterparts in Bihar, seemed much less powerful today. Um, than perhaps you know two or three you know perhaps a generation ago um, so firstly you saw fragmentation of estates due to the division amongst sons so you know as you know families grow you know a, fa a household that's maybe had a hundred you know 50 bigger you know now they had you know seven eight biggers divided amongst many different family members you saw high levels of out migration so many landlords in one of the villages we worked in in Donisha, the landlords had actually just left completely. The landlords had moved to India, they moved to Kolkata or somewhere. So they'd originally, you know, been there as powerful landlords, but due to political change, due to greater opportunity next day, they sold off their land and left. Also significantly in Nepal, I think, is the People's War, you know, the Maoist conflict between 1996 and 2006. This encouraged, proportionally encouraged many of the old landlord class to essentially sell off their estates. Uh, so land wasn't so much confiscated, but the kind of the fear of the conflict and the fear of kind of land reform in the future resulted in many selling off their land and leaving. Some moved to the city, some moved to India, some moved elsewhere. And um, so what was interesting is that while many of these people had sold their land, the beneficiaries that were not the poor farmers, it was mostly medium and rich farmers who had a little bit of capital and had some money who were able to kind of buy up some of the land. Um, from the landlords. So what we're seeing is a shift from a system whereby the landlords are dominant to a, shift to a system whereby middle and large farmers remain dominant at a local level. So this is, you know, we did a, a, a survey of four Danish villages. Uh, we find 76% of the sample across these four villages were essentially marginal farmers with less than one hectare of land, but there was no notable sort of landlord class. Most of the landlords had left 
sold off their estates. A large class of large farmers, around eight percent of the sample were you know, rich farmers with more than two hectares, but they owned just a third of the holdings, and they didn't have you know total monopoly over land like you know, would see maybe uh, a generation ago. Thirty percent of the land was under tenancy, uh, so there's still high levels of tenancy, and also a large number of tenant farmers. Uh, but these are not you know they're not working for big zamindars. Also, very, very exploited in money lending. So, money lending was increasingly replacing rent actually as the primary mechanism of exploitation, the primary mechanism of surplus appropriation. And this is particularly linked to the migration economy, people taking loans to go overseas, often at extortionate rates of interest. But what's interesting though is that there isn't just one powerful landlord stroke money lender, there's many, many different money lenders who they can choose from, all of whom are charging very high rates of interest. Now, the third trajectory is the rise of absentee landlordism. Now, this is particularly unique, uh, we noticed in the Nepal Thailand Madesh. We saw a little bit of Bihar, but it seems particularly a phenomenon east of the Koshi in the sort of Thalu and Rajbanshi domain. And this is really, this has historical reasons. And this has the legacy of the kind of the Rana era distribution of big land grants, you know, Birta grants to the hill elite. So these are large landlords, mostly from the um, the Palestinian community who own you know, significant estates in places like Mora and Simsari. But we've also observed uh, in other parts of the Terai, such as Rupandehi, Nawal Parasi, and these kind of regions, particularly in sort of Tharu domains. So um, what's happened in this case, which is very interesting and very unique, is the economic liberalization and the expansion of markets. In, in Danisha, for example, it's led to the decline in landlordism. Whereas in the Morang region, it's had the opposite effect. It's actually resulted in an increase in landlordism. It's a different type of landlordism. This is Morang's and Sari region. You've got higher land value because it's more fertile, higher rainfall, more accessible. It's close to the industrial centers of the Eastern Terai, good road infrastructure. And this means that the incentive to sell off the land is much less. In Danisha, the land had very little, in the outlying parts of Danisha, land had a very low value. So the landlords didn't have much incentive to hold on to this land. Whereas in the Morang region, these absentee landlords had a strong incentive to hold on to the land because of speculative value of the land. You know, the land value would increase in the future. The landlords themselves are also very different. They've got very, very strong links to the state. They live in kind of, you know, these political outposts for Kathmandu, such as Bharatnagar, for example. So as a result, these landlords didn't feel sort of as afraid of you know, losing their land during the time of political unrest. You know, they were quite comfortable that they had strong political connections. And this is what the interview suggested anyway. That, you know, they had strong political connections. They were not afraid of land reform, for example, in the future. Whereas in Danisha, many of these landlords were quite afraid of land reform in the future. So that was one reason to sell for estates. Uh, so this is given a case study of the Southern Plains of Morang. This is the region where I did PhD research in 2007. This is just an area just east of, northeast of Bharatnagar. Um, so just to talk a bit about the history, this was once a forest, heavily forested belt, uh, predominantly home to Tharu, Rajbanshi, Bonta, Ganga communities. But these communities were increasingly subordinated to the centralized run of feudalism uh, in the 19th century. Uh, the absentee landlord class had quite a long, a long history in this region because, you know, as I said earlier, they received land grants during the Rana period. And in the 1960s, there were land reforms, but what the land reforms did was that the indigenous family landlords often lost their land. And the, the kind of hill origin landlords who had these political connections were able to retain their land. So, they, and, you know, it was this group which became the kind of the absentee landlords which you see today. There was also rising speculative investment in land by city dwellers, including many of these landlords themselves. They, throughout the 60s and 70s, they kept buying more and more land due to the potential speculative value of the land. Now, um, there is this Talal of Morang. This village, you know, this former VDC, 78, so nearly 79% of the land is under tenancy. So this is actually a substantial amount of land under tenancy. And three quarters of this land belongs to the absentee landlords from places like Kathmandu and Bharatnagar and Dharam and so on, but particularly Kathmandu and Bharatnagar. So um, 
a significant, so you're talking about the, the vast majority of farmers essentially are giving away half of their harvest um, to landlords living in the cities. Um, but there is differences, you know, unlike the kind of the, the first trajectory, these local, this traditional local landlordism, which you see in Madhavani and Bihar and in the coastal floodplains, is a much more distant relationship. So some of them never hardly meet the landlord. Landlord maybe comes once a year at a time when it's time to repair the rent. Sometimes they don't meet them at all, they meet a company, a, a local agent, or also the Katawala or the grain merchant will be the intermediary who will collect the rent on behalf of the landlord. There's also the very limited ideological ties between landlords and tenants, so you don't see the kind of local level oppressive power structures that were in place. However, in spite of this, landlords have significant economic power due primarily to the sheer monopoly they have over land. There are also other problems with that with your landlordism. You know, the local landlords in Bihar, for example, they would often, often invest in things like tube wells for irrigation, you know, repairing canals and things like that. For the absentee landlords, there's often limited interest in investing on the land. So, for example, farmers, one of the farmer recounted, you know, he had asked the landlord if they could install a tube well on the land, and the landlord essentially said, oh, you know, um, you know, if you want to install a tube well, you can do that yourself. Of course, the, farm, the tenant wasn't going to invest in a tube well because it wasn't his land. So the landlords themselves have very limited interest in the land. There's often very low investment in irrigation and other infrastructure. And what's quite interesting um, is, you know, looking at some of the panel data from Laurent between 2007 and 2019. So I, I went and we went and re-interviewed the same households after 12 years to see what had changed. And we find that there was no evidence of declining landlord control. So amongst the same group of farmers, for example, who we revisited after 12 years, the area of land of the, the area of land which was rented within the street had actually increased from 59% to 64%. So actually the area of land had actually increased. The area of land under tenancy had increased. And the proportion of land which belonged to absentee landlords was 78% in 2007. And it was basically the same in 2019, it was 77%. So, you know, it dropped by 1% only. And there was a lot of land transactions taking place. So there was a dynamic land market, but this was taking place outside of the landlord estates. So this was essentially transactions which were taking place between farmers, between local farmers. So this severely restricted any opportunity for the landless Adivasi farmers to essentially access land. So, the, you know, for example, 10 hectares of 10.5 hectares of land was bought by these farmers uh, over that 12 year period, but only 8.9% um, of the total purchases were from the absentee landlords. In fact, more land had actually been sold to absentee landlords than had been bought from absentee landlords. So in sum, what are these three trajectories of change? Well, I think it's clear that the trajectory of change in landlordism is divergent. Some areas are, you're seeing declining landlordism, again, particularly in the Madesh, but what you're seeing is that the decline of the kind of traditional Madeshi landlord class is balanced by the continued power of the urban-based absentee landlords in places like Moran and Shinsari, who have much closer links to the central state. And this, is, this raises interesting questions about, you know, the alignment to changing political power relations and the central state as well. But this is a whole another study. Uh, absentee landlordism appears to be increasing, and this is likely to emerge as a greater challenge in the future, particularly in Bihar also. We're beginning to see a rise in absentee landlordism in Bihar as, you know, landlords hold on to their estates due to its speculative value, yet move to the cities. But even in areas um, with more traditional landlord-tenant relations, such as in Madhubani of Bihar and in Koiladi and Sabdari, these political and ideological power relations are still there, but they are breaking down. They're different to what they were in the 70s. But in spite of all these changes, landlessness actually continues to rise. So I think that is the key message we need to take home, is that landlordism is still increasing in spite of these changes. So just to give an example, the Nepal Living Standards Survey, this shows the yellow line here shows the percentage of landless households. This is in the East and Central Territory. You can see clearly that it is increasing gradually over time. And the percent owning land 
is clearly declining and the percentage of tenants is increasing, although only marginally. <clears throat> so what, how, if we do want to revisit, what, uh, how do we understand? Fraser, yes. Fraser? Yeah. Fraser, uh, could you please sum up in five minutes? Sure, yeah, I'm on my kind of second last slide. Uh, we'll... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So um, okay. just to conclude, I mean, um, if we revisit the so-called semi-feudalism debate, well, it's clear that the classical models of feudalism for the 70s and 80s are of less relevance today. Uh, but these studies themselves were based upon quite a shaky definition of feudalism. If you look at the key definition of feudalism, as per Marx himself, it is still very relevant in the larger Mithila region, in spite of all the changes that have taken place. You're seeing concentration of land, appropriation of surplus through ground rent, um, and use of surplus for consumption rather than productive reinvestment. And this has resonance for the kind of rent seeking or Dalal economy, as you might call it. And another interesting thing is that in spite, amongst all of these three trajectories of change, one thing that is increasing is indebtedness and money lending and losing money due to rent, so sorry, due to interest, uh, is significantly uh, a rising drain on agricultural production. So um, what does this mean in terms of opportunities for political change? Well, I think it's critical that redistributive land reform does not drop from the policy agenda. Redistributive land reform is really the only solution to some of these challenges of landlord-tenant relations. But it also needs to be matched with political awareness of the grassroots. The reason that land reforms were successful in West Bengal, for example, was that it was matched by a very strong political campaign and strong political mobilization at the village level. Now this is, there are opportunities for this because there has been political changes locally. There's been a huge increase in the political awareness in the local population compared to a generation before. You know, even in these powerful areas where you've got powerful landlords in Manumani and Bindar, for example, people are much more politically aware than they were uh, a generation ago. Um, then there's also a link between landlordism and caste, which has been diluted as of the sort of ties of debt funders to the landlords. Then there's been a number of political movements, Maori's movement in Nepal, the Madesh Andolans in Nepal, the sort of OBC politics in Bihar. These all have diverse aims, but they've collectively increased awareness of entrenched inequalities. So this is possibly an opportune moment for collective mobilization for social justice amongst the marginal and tenant farmer class. And it's also um, useful to look at you know, the larger issues to do with imperialism, the structure of the economy. Landlordism flourishes in the context of a very distorted pattern of industrial development mm -hmm. in a very import-dependent economies, such as Nepal, and there's an absence of exit opportunities. Uh, so, you know, its solution doesn't only lie in land reform, it also involves, you know, building Nepal's domestic industrial capacity, building the industrial capacity of states such as Bihar and India. Because the organic emergence of capitalism would undermine landlord tenant relations. You know, if people have opportunities outside of agriculture, they no longer need to depend on rented land for their subsistence. You're also seeing, and another thing I should also say is that migrant labor is not a solution. People often say, what about migration? Well, migrant labor brings income into the household, but it's an equilibrium. You know, they still need to rent land to meet their food needs. You know, the remittances that they get from migrant labor is not sufficient to undermine their dependence on landlords for the means of production. What this really does is migrant labor supplements a fragile livelihood. And you see a dual exploitation, exploitation by landlords as well as exploitation by employers overseas. So on that note, I'm going to kind of wind up. Thank you for the time and welcome for any questions or anything.